In this short video tutorial, we're going to have a look at the anatomy of the scalp. In clinical practice, an understanding of the anatomy of the scalp becomes very helpful for understanding one, how certain injuries to the scalp might present, and two, how we might manage injuries to the scalp, particularly, for example, if the skin has been incised and we have an open wound. So how might a patient present with some form of scalp injury? Well, usually it's probably secondary to some form of trauma or injury to the head itself. And as a result, one must also consider that if there is some signs of injury to the scalp, the mechanism of injury and whether there's potentially any underlying more concerning complications, um, for example, a skull fracture or some form of damage to the um, underlying brain. Even with a relatively minor bump to the head, you can sometimes see evidence of injury to the scalp or the various scalp layers. I'm sure many of you have inadvertently bumped your head against uh, a door frame or the corner of something uh, and not long afterwards noticed a very small uh, lump on the side of your head. So let's take a closer look then at the anatomy of the scalp and the layers that, that form it. So if we take this gentleman here um, again on the right and imagine that we're taking a, an incision through the top of the head just here. So we're going to cut through um, the various layers of the scalp and look at these in a little bit more detail. So the first of the layers that we've come to, or the most superficial of the scalp layers, would be the skin. So we'll draw that um, as our first slide and we'll draw that in um, blue. And let's not forget that the skin itself actually consists of multiple layers uh, that can be broadly divided into the epidermis and the dermis. And actually it's within the dermis of the skin that we find hair follicles, um, sweat glands and uh, a number of sebaceous glands which uh, secrete a sort of oily uh, substance. And it's not unusual for patients to present with blockages to the sebaceous glands in particular causing what's known as a sebaceous cyst. So let's look at the layer that's underneath the skin. And this is known as the dense connective tissue layer. And this layer, as its name suggests, has a very dense arrangement of connective tissue. And it's within this plane that we will find the arteries and veins that supply the scalp and also the cutaneous nerves that are supplying the skin of the scalp as well. So it's a very vascular layer. Um, but also a very dense connective tissue layer. And the walls of these blood vessels are actually attached to the, the connective tissue within this layer, such that when you have wounds to the scalp um, that obviously cut through to this dense connective tissue layer and injure some of these vessels, that they're prohibited somewhat from being able to vasoconstrict due to the pull of the attachments of the connective tissue in which these blood vessels are sitting. And that's why uh, injuries to the scalp that cut through the skin and into this layer and damage the blood vessels can bleed quite profusely. And why it's very important to apply firm pressure um, over the wound to help try and provide some form of external compression and hemostasis from these bleeding blood vessels. Now, not all injuries to the scalp result in an open wound. So, for example, in this gentleman on the right here, we can see that there's evidence he's had a bump to the head and rather than an open wound with blood pouring out, we've actually just got the appearance of a bump. So why has this happened? So again, this can be explained by looking at this dense connective tissue layer. So if there's been some external trauma to the head involving the scalp, then even if we've not actually cut through the skin and into the dense connective tissue layer, there can still be some damage to the blood vessels within the dense connective tissue layer and therefore some hemorrhage or blood leaving the ruptured vessels. Because this dense connective tissue layer is dense, when blood does escape from a damaged blood vessel, it can't track very far within this layer. So if I just demonstrate on the vessel here, for example, if blood starts to empty from this injured vessel into the dense connective tissue layer, then its tracking is going to be prohibited somewhat in the plane that is the dense connective tissue layer. However, 
as blood begins to fill, as this vessel continues to, to bleed, what we might actually see is a lump appearing um, on the surface of the skin where the volume of blood of blood has started to push up against the uh, the epidermis and dermis of the skin. So hopefully you can appreciate therefore why sometimes in scalp or head injuries we see quite a well uh, circumscribed localised bump as a result of bleeding from uh, some of the blood vessels in this dense connective tissue layer. So let's move on to our next layer within the scalp, which is the aponeurosis um, or the epicranial um, aponeurosis. And this is a thin but relatively tough layer of uh, tenderness tissue, which um, if we look at an image demonstrating the lateral view of the, of the head and the uh, scalp, we can see that it arises from a muscle posteriorly known as the occipitalis muscle, which itself has a bony origin from the superior nuchal line on the occipital bone. And as it becomes this uh, tendon, this extends forward anteriorly and um, meets with a muscle known as the frontalis muscle. And the frontalis muscle uh, continues forward and actually inserts into the um, fibres of the orbicularis oculi muscle and the tissues uh, associated with the orbit. So the frontalis muscle therefore doesn't actually have any bony attachment. Unlike the occipitalis muscle which we know has a, a bony origin here on the occipital bone, the frontalis muscle instead arises from an aponeurosis and inserts into uh, subcutaneous tissue and muscle rather than bone. And that's just an important thing to note when we start to look at the layer beneath the aponeurosis, the subaponeurotic or loose connective tissue layer, because it has importance and relevance to the extent at which bleeding or infection can spread um, when that infection or blood is lying beneath this aponeurotic layer. So these first three layers that we have here, the skin, the dense connective tissue layer and the aponeurosis actually act uh, almost as a sort of single functional unit in that because of this dense connective tissue layer there is a very strong uh, adherence between the skin and the uh, much deeper aponeurotic layer. Thus in certain injuries to the scalp, for example in scalping injuries where for example um, a quite large proportion of uh, someone's hair may get trapped in machinery if there is significant force, what can happen is that these three layers of the scalp can become avulsed or stripped away from the top of the head um, as a sort of collective set of, uh, of layers. So as we move further into the layers of the scalp, we come to the loose connective tissue layer. And the loose connective tissue layer, as the name suggests, is uh, a layer of very loosely arranged uh, connective tissue that sits just beneath the aponeurosis. And you can get an appreciation for this loose connective tissue layer by um, just popping your hand on top of your head and trying to wriggle or move the scalp. And you'll see actually that there is a degree of, of movement and that's because of the loose connective tissue uh, allowing uh, the other layers of the scalp to slide over the uh, essentially the, the bones of the, of the skull. So let's just add in the um, final layer of our layers of the scalp, the fifth layer, which is known as the periosteum. And before I add this, I'm just going to uh, draw on the bone of the, of the skull, or the calvaria. And then I can just add in the periosteal layer, which, um, as I've said, is the fifth and final layer that forms the scalp. And quite helpfully, the layers of the scalp can be remembered by the word scalp. So if I show you, we have the S, which is the skin, the dense connective tissue layer, the aponeurosis, the loose connective tissue layer, and the periosteum. So as you can appreciate that the first letters of each of these parts or layers of the scalp actually quite helpfully spell the word scalp. 
Now we haven't quite finished our consideration of the um, anatomy of the scalp, um, particularly with regards to just coming back to the loose connective tissue layer. So the loose connective tissue layer, even though it's not our main vascular plane, which we've already explained is this dense connective tissue layer, we do have vessels obviously feeding the tissues of this layer, but also vessels that actually traverse the space. And this is vessels known as emissary veins. And these are not to be confused with bridging veins. Um, where bridging veins are veins that we actually find uh, connecting intracranial vein venous structures. So these emissary veins um, actually connect veins that are in our dense connective tissue layer with venous structures that we find intracranially, so deep to the bone of the skull. So if I add on one of these intracranial venous structures, i.e. a dural venous sinus, and also add to the image, just for the sake of completeness, um, the brain, so here would be the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. So here we have uh, essentially the dura, um, or sort of most external of our um, meningeal layers, and this here is a dural venous sinus, which is created by the separation of, of two layers of dura. So as I've said, there is a connection uh, between these extracranial venous structures running in the scalp, the dense connective tissue layer, and these intracranial um, venous sinuses. And the connection is um, via the emissary veins so these emissary veins actually have to pass through the bone of the skull. And what you can hopefully also appreciate here is that this emissary vein here is traversing the loose connective tissue layer. Thus, in injuries to the scalp, so not only might you get some bleeding within the dense connective tissue layer due to damage of the veins or even the arteries that, that run here, but you may also uh, actually damage the uh, emissary vein as it's crossing through the loose connective tissue layer. So injuries to the scalp can sometimes lead to bleeding in, in a number of layers of the scalp. And if there is bleeding from an emissary vein and we start to see blood starting to um, track within the loose connective tissue layer, because it is a loose connective tissue, uh, the spread of blood in this plane is, is not limited. In fact, um, we're in a layer that is beneath the aponeurosis, and thus any bleeding can actually spread um, underneath the aponeurosis um, to the extent of, of which the aponeurosis inserts into bone. And if you recall from that earlier image, the aponeurosis posterior inserts into the um, occipital bone here, but anteriorly, the aponeurosis, which then continues as the frontalis muscle, has no bony insertion, instead blending with the orbicularis oculi muscle and the tissues around the orbit. So thus, when we get bleeding in this loose connective tissue layer, the blood can track underneath this aponeurosis and these muscles, and will track um, as far as the insertion into bone permits. Now, posteriorly, we've said that's going to be the superior nuchal line here. But anteriorly, um, the, bread, the, the blood can actually spread and um, start to uh, accumulate beneath the orbicularis oculi muscle just here. And that can be quite readily visible um, as opposed to um, have the blood tracked posteriorly where it would gather um, either beneath the aponeurosis here or the occipitalis muscle. Um, all of which would be um, covered by hair for the most part. So what can happen sometimes is in uh, injuries to the scalp, patients can actually present with um, bruising around the um, orbit, either on one side or, or on both sides. So if we take a look at this image here of this lady who's clearly had a, a significant bump to the head here, we can also see that there's evidence of swelling and bruising around the orbit. Uh, and at the very bridge of the nose here, uh, but it doesn't extend down to see the, the rest of the face. Now, this could have arisen as a result of the um, injury to the, um, the scalp in terms of 
the loose connective tissue layering and bleeding um, passing underneath the frontalis muscle and into the um, tissues around the um, orbit just here. It is important, however, to remember that there are obviously um, other causes, um, potentially more concerning causes for swelling and bruising around the orbit. For example, direct trauma to this part of the face would inevitably cause some swelling and bruising, and we might be concerned about um, fractures to the orbit or damage to the underlying eye. Equally, the other thing to just to point out is that, um, again, in significant head injuries where there may be an anterior cranial fossa floor fracture, that too can also present with um, periorbital um, bruising. Um, often sometimes affecting both sides. So while this may arise from um, what could be considered a, a less concerning injury, um, from a, a scalp uh, um, hemorrhage, they are obviously much more concerning things that can also cause uh, bruising and they must obviously be considered in the context of the mechanism of the injury and how else the patient is presenting. So we've considered the various layers of the scalp and some of the structures that run through them, mostly obviously alluding to some of the blood vessels and how when they bleed they can track in, in very different ways depending on whether it's the dense or loose connective tissue layer. And that's not to say that when someone has an injury to the scalp that you can't have elements of bleeding within, within both layers. Now another consideration is, is infections of the scalp and they follow sort of very similar principles to, to bleeding in terms of their spread. So infections within the deep connective tissue layer, um, much like bleeding, will not spread very far and it's often quite well localised, uh, forming often a, 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 a bump that's quite tender. Whereas infections in the loose connective tissue, which uh, as we know is underneath the aponeurosis, can spread uh, a lot more freely and therefore may all be of, uh, of greater concern than any infection that's a little bit more superficial. The other concern with scalp infections is that we know that there is this venous connection between extracranial um, vessels and veins uh, within the scalp and these intracranial venous structures. So infections within the scalp can uh, potentially, rarely but potentially, spread from the scalp uh, into intracranial structures uh, and lead to um, all sorts of uh, quite nasty potential complications uh, like meningitis for example. And because we have the emissary veins traversing this loose connective tissue layer and that this plane offers much greater freedom for infection to, to move around, um, there is a, a greater risk of infection spreading from this loose connective tissue layer intracranially than say from a, um, the dense connective tissue layer. So wounds to the scalp, particularly open wounds, um, we have to make sure, as we do with wounds on, on any other parts of the body, are, are particularly clean and kept clean so that there isn't that, that risk of, uh, if infection did develop, uh, potentially spreading um, deeper uh, and into our intracranial structures. So as a final thought, um, again, just coming back to how wounds to the scalp might present. A wound like this, for example, uh, could probably be uh, easily uh, glued um, after being cleaned um, and, and probably not require any sutures necessarily. This wound, on the other hand, on the right hand side, uh, you can see is um, much deeper and more importantly is gaping open. And the reason that this wound is gaping is that because it's deeper, it's actually traversed the skin, the dense connective tissue layer, and the um, aponeurosis. And as you recall, the um, aponeurosis um, of the scalp has uh, two muscle bellies at its anterior and posterior end, the frontalis and occipitalis muscles. So when there is a wound that um, cuts across the aponeurosis in a, in a transverse plane, uh, you have the pull of the uh, frontalis muscle anteriorly and the pull of the occipitalis muscle posteriorly and that helps to um, cause the wound to gape open. So in wanting to repair this wound it would be very important that the two cut edges of the aponeurosis are brought back together and sutured uh, 
um, before uh, attempts were then made to also suture the, uh, the skin uh, along with the uh, dense connective tissue layer back together. So that concludes this video tutorial of the anatomy of the scalp. And I hope that you can appreciate the uh, clinical relevance and application of understanding the anatomy of this region of the body.